You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything screenwriting. Here we interview successful screenwriters and filmmakers to find out just what it takes to make it in the industry. All right, welcome to the podcast. We have on an awesome guest from across the pond. We have on filmmaker Maureen O'Connell. Hey, how's it going? Oh man, so glad to have you on today. Uh, So you are a filmmaker and screenwriter in Ireland. I watched one of your short films called Girls, and it was very topical. Girls is about this this teenager who's kind of struggling at home, seeking, it looks like seeking attention, ends up getting into some violent situations and almost like a mob rule, which is very topical right now. I shot that in 2009, would you believe? Oh, wow. And, um, yes, I, sh- I shot it ages ago. And then I, it, um, basically what happened was it was in the summer of 2009, and then I, I'm an actor as well, so I got into RADA in that summer. When I, as I was shooting it, I found out I got into RADA, which is in London, a big acting school in London. And um, so when we finished shooting it, then I had to start in RADA in September. So I was going over to London and I had to live there and everything for three years to do that acting course. So I was editing it uh, online with the editor, kind of going back and forth uh, via emails, kind of giving him notes and this type of thing. Um, and then it came out, went to the Cork Film Festival. Okay. Um, and then it didn't really get into very many festivals, would you believe it? <laughs> I was really annoyed. And, um, I talked to uh, a festival guy and uh, he said, yeah, but you know, girls, because it's, it's girls, it's called girls, you know, and it's, it's about young girls, very young right. girls, like, uh, you know, 13, 12, 13, who, who are extremely violent and, and get involved in this mob kind of violence or created. Yeah, and um, he said, "Yeah, but girls aren't really that violent," is what he said to me. And the thing is, it's based on true. It's, it actually happened. Oh, and I I've, believe it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's a uh, a raw um, there's a raw truth to it that when you're watching, they like, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm the father of a teenager, and so I I know that the kind of emotions that they struggle with and how they're trying to find themselves. It's interesting being a parent of a teenager because they want independence, but yet they still want the love and coddling that you would give like a younger child, but they don't want to show that. So you almost kind of have to like force the hug. Um, And, uh, and with, with the way you show it in girls, she, that main character is, is that's all she wants. She wants to be accepted by family or friends. Um, And so this really resonated. And I think it, it holds up for being that, I mean, 2009, I couldn't really tell Um, it holds up, but I wanted to bring you on the show. Um, because you found some success with girls and this goes well, well beyond contests, you know, because there are contests that you can send films or screenplays to, and you can get a nice award or, or a crappy award, you know, but it's about what can come out of it. And you were able to get girls pitched to screen Ireland and you found success that way. Yes, right. So Screen Ireland is like a state funded um, um, organization. So any big films that come out of Ireland are kind of backed by Screen Ireland, you know, Yeah. Uh, or big TV series or this type of thing. So they always have um, uh, funding things that you can apply for either uh, pre-production, production or uh, development or this type of thing, you know. So I went for uh, one of them called Spotlight and I have a co-writer, amazing co-writer, Gemma Cray. And um, we, uh, I, I sent in the short film Girls, and I said, so I want to, you know, base it off of this short film and um, create a feature film. And so if we got Spotlight, which we did, um, they pay you basically to develop it with them. And they give you uh, aids, like they give you workshops, and they give you mentoring. And uh, they also give, they gave us a brilliant script editor in Cynthia de Souza. Wow. Who's a British uh, uh, screenwriter and producer. She's amazing. And really lovely as well. Her notes are kind of inspired. So she's really helped the process uh, with a pair of us. So now we have a first draft of a feature film and we're just honing it down. And so then we have to give it into Screen Ireland at the end of February. Now it is. So, um, but yeah, we're all good to go. We're basically just polishing it now. And um, so, yeah, and then I hope to uh, get into production. Right. 
that's the next step. So, so with Screen Ireland, it sounds like it's a pretty competitive thing to to get into if you have a bunch of different filmmakers going in there. So, the fact that you're able to get it is pretty huge, and that you can really leverage that. Um, what kind of differences do you think? Because you've been to London, you've been you've been you've been around. What kind yeah. of differences do you think filmmaking in Ireland is compared to other places? I suppose, like, I mean, when I was in London, I was two and a half years in Arada and I was trying to be an actor. And um, I mean, it's very difficult in England, especially when you've a name like Maureen O'Connell. Like, you, I only got seen for the Irish parts. Is that right? Yeah, so you're <laughs> automatically kind of typecasted. Yeah, totally. And I mean, just spent three years in classical acting training you know, I can do every accent on the song. <laughs> like, anyway. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, so, so basically, yeah. So you're only seeing for, you know, Irish parts. And uh, and because I've made my own films anyway already, I thought, well, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. I'm waiting for someone to give me a job. I just go create it myself. Go back to what I've always done. I always created my own work. But I felt like in London, you can't do that because the reason is London has, a proper film industry so they have a proper structure so if you have any talent what you usually do is you become like an ad and you shoot up and you start making money gotcha what is i mean that's seductive because you want to make money because the rents in london are huge and this type of thing right what ends up happening is you're so tired then and you get involved in that kind of way that you don't actually create and you don't direct because you, you kind of have it in your head oh it takes ages now to direct i have to yeah you have to put your you have to put your time in start from the bottom right exactly yeah whereas in ireland there isn't any <laughs> industry. There is a film scene. I would call it a film scene because it was too small. Now it is developing, and we're 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 getting some huge. Um, the county council in Greystones Wicklow just decided to give us the go ahead for a huge film studio. Oh wow, that's great! So Dublin, that's coming in, and we have a huge one in Limerick called Troy Studios. So it's it's really beginning i think i think eventually we will have a really great film industry but at the moment it's still kind of a film scene but what is great about that is there's tons of really really talented people on the ground and we and we never have any money and it's kind of i, I, th- I think it's ours is quite like a socialistic you know kind of a place it kind of yeah. um, and we all so, so, so the community spirit's quite strong and we all help each other just make our own stuff and yeah. because we like to be creative it it's like a, it's, it sounds like a small town film community, you know. It is, isn't yeah. It? It's pretty sound like, you know. So, so you can begin directing. That's what I mean. Like that, if you want yeah. to, and you have no money, you can still do it. And I've done it time and time again. All those shorts, and I did it with Spa Weekend, a feature film, and I've just only recently directed my first funded short film from Screen Ireland called Home. Um, and now obviously I'm developing this feature film with them as well. So hopefully. I'll get funded for that feature film. But yeah, so the reason why they're taking me seriously is because I've had loads of experience as a director. Yeah. Now, if it's in London, that wouldn't have happened. But I would have made money in London. <laughs> so just yeah, so it's like, it's, it's like being a big fish in a little pond and then kind of going over to London and then and yeah. then having to start up. I could understand why you'd want to go back and then just have creative control over your own projects. Plus, I I see yeah. the other benefit is you're on the ground floor of something that sounds like it's it's going to explode which would be pretty yeah. amazing yeah i'd want to be on the ground floor of that yeah exactly it's, it's quite exciting i have to say um we've really great people in screen ireland at the moment because we had this thing back in 2016 sorry it's, it's uh, you know i'm interrupting you but this is quite important it's quite an important cultural moment in ireland it's called waking the feminists okay and what happened was um our Abbey Theatre, which is our national theatre, um, they were celebrating the centenary. So in 1916, there was a huge rebellion against the British. And okay. uh, eventually then we ended up having our own republic. And so we're not part of the UK, we're not part of anything. You know, we're, we're the Republic of Ireland. And it, and it kind of started in 1916. And so we were celebrating this. It was 100 years since it. There was loads of celebrations going on. So the Abbey Theatre, which was involved in all the stuff that happened in 1916 as well, Huh. Um, and uh, you know our, our, our proclamation was, was all about equality between men and women like we proclaimed this from the steps of the GPO back in 1916 and um, the Abbey Theatre decided with Fiat McCungle being the artistic director decided to put on all these plays written by men bar one <laughs> so what happened was there was an explosion 
And so uh, women actresses, um, directors, writers, production yeah. designers stormed the Abbey Theatre and screamed the house down, screamed the house down. And then wow. they went up uh, one by one onto the stage and, and talked about times where they'd been bullied, which they felt they'd never been able to speak about before, times where they hadn't been funded over and over and over again. And they quoted statistics and facts, as, you know, it was, wow. you know, you know, one approved argument, but they just went nuts, quite rightly so. And um, so what happened then as a result of that, all the arts kind of funding bodies in Ireland had to check themselves. Screen Ireland ended up really checking themselves, which was brilliant. And they brought on loads of women onto the, onto the board of Screen Ireland. Uh, so they're all making choices now, which is great. And that's why I finally got funded. I know wow. it is. I know it is. Because I couldn't get funded before then. Not by Screen Ireland, but even by even county councils and stuff around the, around the country and things. And they all have to check themselves now as well. And there's tons of female directors now coming on board, which, which you never saw before. Yeah, uh, which is lunacy, you know. So where can the feminists happen? And that's why Amazing. that's why they're in Ireland are, they, and the, the, they they just did another funding thing, and it's brilliant. They have loads of kind of non-white Irish people now who have been selected, you know, to develop scripts. Um, loads of women, and it, like it's amazing. Yeah, a lot so, of diversity. Yeah, it's really that's exciting. great. No, that's exciting. That is really cool. Um, yeah. Screen Ireland sounds like it's it's really upping its game and and creating opportunities where where really there weren't any. Um, so with the filmmaking industry in Ireland, it sounds like it's still kind of at that guerrilla level. Yeah, to a certain extent, but I think that that's good. I think it's kind of good for people for a filmmaker because it's a vocation. It's not like a proper job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think it is. You know, you really like. You know, you just you're not. Yeah, you've got to be. You got to be passionate about it. Yeah, and it it is kind of. Um, I always see it as kind of like a spiritual thing. You know, you've got to constantly kind of step out in faith in yourself, even when you've got no money and stuff, and kind of you know lead a group of people and uh, you know try to create something that you believe in that you think is either entertaining or whatever it is. You know, right. um, and and from that you grow as an artist. You know, and then hopefully. You know, money, you know, you will be able to start paying bills <laughs> eventually and stuff and pay for oneself. Um, I mean, that's that's the real think... struggle. It's, it's like that around the yeah. world, you know. There's yeah. the, uh, I almost want to say, at least with screenwriting, there's this fantasy that that they've got the screenplay, they're going to sell it and, and, and make a ton of money and get the huge job in Hollywood and everything's going to be great. And that's just not, it's yeah, just not no. the reality. It, it takes a long time. It took me a decade before I even started to get even just a little bit of success. And I have to assume you've been doing this for a while as well. Oh, I mean, since yeah. 2009. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you and you're and you're now you're tapping into those successes with with Screen Ireland and being paid to write this feature, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Spa Weekend, and, and I got to watch a sneak peek on this. Um, what a funny film! <laughs> really, you. really clever. You've got a good um, wit for humor and situational comedy. There's a scene that I liked where. Um, the main character and the love interest, Stoney, are chatting and they're both really into each other. And so they're pseudo flirting. Yeah. And, 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 but you write the subtext on there and it pops up in little bubbles of what they're really That's thinking. True. And I haven't seen that before. I, I mean, usually with subtext and subtext, but, but you want the extra uh, mile of including like, oh, I totally want to sleep with her. And then he's, and then yeah. she's like, I don't know if I want to sleep with him. And I thought that was really cute and it was clever. Um, so yeah. that had a nice little dimension dimension to that scene. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah. actually, it's funny in that in that scene that you mention it because um, I hadn't initially written that in, um, uh, and that was my scene that I because I co-wrote uh, Spy Weekend with Carl Ardu, and that particular scene um, I did write it. But what ended up happening was when we walked in to that cafe to shoot it, I got to say I was a bit nervous. So I had to kind of perform and I had to make sure that everyone like every time you walk on set you're kind of nervous you know it's kind of bubbling kind of energy sure and I walked in and the owner wasn't there but there was people that his staff were there and they were Italians it was an Italian cafe and your man couldn't speak English I don't know what he was saying in broken English he said something to me like the boss was down the road or something and I went oh yeah the scrancher and I, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know what he was talking about 
And so then I started it and um, I got lots of ta- uh, uh, takes of Stoney. And then I turned the camera around, I was getting me. And on my, I had one take on that long kind of me, re- you know, reacting to Stoney. In the middle of that, the boss walks in. So he's over Stoney's shoulder. And like, I'm like trying to kind of say hello without kind of the camera kind of seeing me. <laughs> and, then, and then he starts scowling at me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> what's going on? And he's giving me filthy daggers, like, you know. Then when I called Cut, I was like, hey, it's going. And he was like, you know, my child is in hospital. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, I've just been at the hospital. And I was like, oh. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? And he, he's like, oh, your mom's trying to tell you. And I was like, was he? Um, so basically, I had like, gone, yeah, yeah, whatever. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, no. And they were yeah, having this family emergency. Uh, so I was like, okay, everyone out, get out. But what happened was because of that my like my performance it was a much longer scene. My performance was all over the place. I didn't know what this guy was doing, so I had to cut it. So I ah. cut it all then, and then after that, I put the uh, the, the subtitles in because I thought it was funny. Because I thought to make the scene work, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a, a clever trick then, as a director, to save the scene. That's brilliant. I mean, I guess that's when you know you're a director is when you can do stuff like that, and then just really uh, cut what you need to and keep what you can. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so how did you find yourself becoming a filmmaker and a screenwriter? Um, well, so I, I am a Dubliner, but we moved to Wicklow, which is one county down from Dublin. And it's uh, it's really uh, beautiful. It's the, the countryside, you know. And I grew up there then as a kid from about six, six years of age on. My dad brought home um, a, a video camera one day. He's, a, he's an agriculture uh, lecturer at <laughs> UCD. And he had to go on these road trips with his students and film farms and cattle and stuff. And so he was kind of doing that and he'd left it down. And I remember seeing it and I used to watch film Spielberg and all that. Because I used to watch them on videotapes, you know? Oh, yeah. You never only had, yeah, like, God, like, it was crazy. Like, you know, when you think of it, the technology is not. <laughs> but, uh, like we only had two channels they're the irish channels and they were terrible so i had to watch these arnie films over and over and over again on video <laughs> and uh, never bring them back to the video shop and stuff it's funny so you I say thought, that. Yes, yeah yeah oh I, i'm just saying you reminded me when i was a kid i watched the same video i think i, think I used to watch willow i watched willow oh my on. god willow was so good oh ah. mad martigan and they don't make them like that anymore i know i know i sound like an album but they don't no, that uh, man, it's such a classic. That was Georgia Lucas too, you know. Yeah, great. So good. All right, so you're watching videos as a kid because we're old. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh... And, then, and then and then so I saw this video camera and I thought, oh, why well, don't I just make my own? So uh... I started to shoot uh, fairy tales because I had my friends who were the actors, the unwilling actors, just bully them into it. Uh, and then <laughs> a director from heart. <laughs> And then, um, because we didn't have a script, because obviously I, I, don't, I, I didn't have a computer or anything, like, you know, so I wasn't going to go, you know, typing up a script. So I was like, you know what happens in Little Red Riding Hood? Just make it up. <laughs> now go, action. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yes. And then I'd edit in camera kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Well, that never works out. I tried that when I was a kid. You'd end up, you know, deleting half of the stuff, recording over it. Um, so, so did that take you to um, acting school to London? Is that where, what happened? Uh, no, so what did I do then? I did, um, I, I did film school first of all. So okay. I went to Ballyfermot in Dublin. <laughs> Ballyfermot, it's so funny when you think Ballyfermot and Rada. Like Ballyfermot, like we, like it's real, <laughs> it's, it's great. It's a great college, but it's a part of Dublin that can be quite kind of, you know, run down and stuff. Oh, I remember okay. walking to college every single day, like you'd have like people shooting up. <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, oh, yes. Hey, love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, but yeah, well, it was a good crack, like, you know, uh, meeting other, you know, filmmakers anyway. Yeah. You know, watching films and studying them and stuff like that. And then we'd shoot our grad films at the end and things. And then after that, I was still acting as I was studying film. I was doing like amateur dramatics and profit share. And so when I graduated from film school, I ended up getting an agent. And oh, great! Did... Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, man. So then I ended up doing lots of acting, 
like classical acting like loads of kind of Wuthering Heights like Kathy and stuff you know we did national tours of Ireland okay uh, the importance of being artist, this type of thing Trojan women even did Greek tragedy and things like that and but I, from the money I made from those shows I made films then that I had written and so I you were a filmmaker's filmmaker <laughs> yeah. you didn't buy the nice <laughs> car you didn't get the nice apartment you just went and made another film <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> that's totally what I did because awesome. um, I actually did have savings as well and I remember I was just thinking about that recently going but I spent it on the film yeah I could have done something I could have gone traveling yeah <laughs> exactly no I, I get it I get it yeah yeah jeez but, but, and then then after then I uh, was in the midst of shooting girls and I had applied to Rad on the off chance just thought I'll see like am I you know good enough to even get to the third audition of Rad or a second audition or something let's see because my directors who directed me in Wuthering Heights kept telling me, he taught at RADA. He's like, you should go to RADA. And he's like, you have to get trained. And I was like, nah. And then I was like, oh, sure, I'll try it. And then I got in. Yeah. I think because I was relaxed, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't nervous then. I was like, oh, who cares if I get in or not? And then I ended up getting in. And I was like, holy <laughs> bag. Oh, sorry. But like, <laughs> then I got in. And so then I had to go because it was, you know, great adventure. So. Yeah, of course. So I, I've been to London. And it's such a huge sit. I mean, it's just giant, you know, and yeah. there's there's every nationality from around the sun in London. It's a big melting pot. Um, now, as the ugly American, I would just uh, kick up conversations with people on the tube, the their subway. <laughs> oh, they hated that. <laughs> they hated it. I, and 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 the more I realized they didn't want to talk to me, the more I would go out of my they way. to. <laughs> Yeah, or you couldn't stop. Yeah, I could. I was like, well, now I have to talk to you because you're going to act <laughs> yeah. this way. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I was totally the ugly American. So as in London, did you find being being someone who is Irish, was yes. there any kind of uh, uh, difficulties other than getting typecasted uh, as an Irish actor? Um, I think... I mean, I, th I think, you know, English people are lovely, really, really nice. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they get a hard time from the Irish, God love them. But, like, uh, I mean, like, that's obviously just historical kind of Yeah, there's some, yeah. <laughs> you know? some so, fire there. Um, yeah, but I think that there are certain things that are interesting, like, certainly, like, at RADA, like, I mean, I said it a few times, and other Irish people would say it as well, like, who've gone to RADA. Um, and, and RADA is great, like, so, I mean, we love RADA. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's just interesting kind of, sometimes the kind of British psychology is like they kind of um they did it's, it's like they didn't know what to do with the Irish they put them on a pedestal and so sometimes we'd be like these really romantic little country people that they ah they're lovely and they, they really sent a nice sense of rhythm and kind of they're kind of soulful and, stuff. and then other times it'd be like the Irish and you shouldn't trust them and kind of <laughs> you know they're always causing trouble always complaining and cranky they're always kind of we always felt like we were either kind of up or yeah, down, up or that's down. Funny. It depended, you know, what the situation was, you know, which one you'd be. I, when I was over there, I was just, uh, they, were, they were nice, but I, I knew nothing. I was the most ignorant American to ever go uh, to London. Yeah, I did. Because I, I was at a restaurant, I ordered a water, and they brought over a sparkling water. And I was like, what is wrong with this water? Why does <laughs> this water taste weird? <laughs> I was like, I just want water, like regular water. And they brought me another one yeah, and it's, it's still sparkling. I'm like, it yeah. tastes funny. So making films in Ireland, it sounds like a challenge, but it sounds like a like a boatload of fun. And yeah. for, for people that aren't in Ireland and can't uh, take advantage of trying to bring their, their film to Screen Iron to get funding, what would you recommend as the guerrilla kind of filmmaking that you're naturally good at having worked in this film community in Ireland? What kind of tips could you pass off to filmmakers or even screenwriters on what they can do to make a, a no-budget film? This podcast is brought to you by TheSuccessfulScreenwriter.com, where you can find instructional books, videos, courses, and screenplays of Hollywood's biggest hits to download. As an added bonus, visit www.thesuccessfulscreenwriter.com to download the guide for every screenwriter for free. Yes, free. Available exclusively at thesuccessfulscreenwriter.com. Now, back to our show. Sure. Um, well, I always think it kind of starts with the... Um 
very basic, but it starts with the decision to commit to making it. So say if you've written the script already and, and uh, you know, you're happy with it. And so now you want to make it. It's, it's literally like, a, it's a, I always come back to this. It's kind of, it is a spiritual decision. You have to kind of say, I'm going to make this and step into that. And then what ends up happening is you end up reaching out to people. You ask them, some people say yes, some people say no. And you begin to gather a team around you and you it has a momentum to it once you have committed to it. You are uh, the momentum. Yeah, you are the momentum, exactly. Okay. But you have to commit 100%. Now, when I when I was making all these films, there was tons of challenges, tons of challenges. But I didn't think, like, I would kind of get annoying, some frustrating things. But I, it never occurred to me that I would not make the film or not finish it because I had committed to it already. Yeah, you leave no so room that, for defeat. Yeah, exactly. So you have to really, really make that decision deep down inside of yourself. And people think they do. They trick themselves. They think they make the decision. And then they go by trying to do it, and then it doesn't turn out. And they go, oh, it didn't work. No, because because you didn't make the decision properly. Do you know? So so you have to be very um, serious with yourself, really. And it's just a quiet moment with yourself. You really commit to the to the project. Yeah. And then yeah. you just step out in faith in yourself. And you kind of, uh, all these things start to happen. And you have to act on it as well. You can't just expect things to happen for you. You have to drive it. Um, and, that's, and that's basically, things will start to happen. I mean, I, I don't know what... Every, Everyone's situation will be, you know, um, people out there who maybe aren't in Ireland and, you know, what the situation is with other film communities in other countries. But I do think um, if you begin, by beginning, I mean commit, um, yeah. you'll, you will find a way. And so it has to be like a volition. You have to have an unbending will to finish this project. Now, do you run into issues because because no budget filmmaking has a has a has a lot of um it can have some negative kind of connotations like people aren't getting paid and people working for free and all of that stuff and that can always be that can always be an issue so do you run into you know problems where you're trying to get talent or issues where you're trying to work with somebody and 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 there is no budget on the table um do you have trouble filling those roles uh, no, no, not really. Um, okay. The thing is, like, I make it quite clear uh, to people that like, this isn't paid. I can pay your expenses. Now you can say yes or no. There's no pressure. Right. Um, so if they say yes, then they have to commit to it as though it's a professional project. Do you know, right. they have to bring you know their talent to the table properly. You know, um, and I, and I would expect that of them. I expect them to turn up on time. I expect them to have done their you know to know their lines and to you know have prepped. No, I, I've never had that problem. I am quite, I suppose, I will be quite confident about um, casting uh, and, and making sure that I can get the performance from people because I've taught acting as well. So, say on Proclaim, there was loads of people who hadn't, who'd done like one thing before or, you know, they're very kind of nervous about it and stuff like that. And because I taught acting, I, I could read them, I knew where they were and I was able to kind of make it bite-sized and easy for them in each scene, you know, and, and kind of break the scene down for them and get the performance that I wanted. Um, so I would never, it's, it's a good thing to know where you are at as well. So when I was making Proclaim, I would never have gone to someone who is well-established and asked them to act in it because they'd ask for money and I don't right. have any money. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I would, like, I wouldn't do that. And so, you know, if, 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 if you're in that situation where you're not getting the talent and because they said there's no budget, then don't be asking them. Right. Ask, are, are, you trying to, are you trying to spot talent? Are you trying to find that actor or that even that cinematographer that you think really has um, a future? And so you want to kind of grab them early on and give them an opportunity? I kind of measure the project out. I kind of see the, you know, if, if we've any budget or, or if we don't, kind of how far can this budget, or I mean, can this film stretch? Can I get this DOP with this? Say for gotcha. home, I always really wanted to work with Borshi Wajnar, who's the cinematographer on it. Now, I wouldn't have asked him for anything else before then, um, because I had no funding in that. And he's he's exceptionally talented, you know. But yeah. he ended up saying, he, he was in the midst of shooting several feature films. Wow. And he came on board for home. Um, so it's kind of, I suppose, I, I yeah, I did see him, but um, I... I I, I wouldn't have asked him beforehand. Um, right. So it's it's waiting to the moment is right. Yeah. Okay. 
and, and also if he's right for that project, it's also making sure, do you know the way sometimes you see someone make, a, say, an Obridge feature film and they bring on someone who's like kind of slightly famous or something mm -hmm. and actually does nothing for the film. Do you know, kind of the wrong casting or yeah, it kind of, it kind of makes the film top heavy or it does something to the energy of the whole thing. Right. Um, whereas in fact, it probably would be much better just casting someone who was just right for the part who wasn't necessarily in any way famous or anything, do you know? Um, yeah. No, I, yeah, some some films will use a uh, a named actor as a uh, marketing for distribution and things like that. Um, and yeah. it can it can work well, but again, it, there but there is cause for hazard there if they're just throwing a name in and not actually really trying to cast the part. So, yeah. uh, but I do want to uh, pick apart this a little bit if you have a few minutes, because sure. uh, you mentioned a professional project, and I think that's really important because I've I mean I've I've been around the block a couple of times, and I've been to I've been to one or two film festivals, and I've seen a lot of low budget indie stuff with. I mean, it's it, you can tell it's low budget and it looks like bad. It sounds like garbage. The acting doesn't exist. The editing was an afterthought. Color correction doesn't even matter. You know, so it, it's not professional and it's low budget. And what I like about your stuff, looking at Spa Week and watching your short films, um, low to no budget, but doesn't look like it. It's professionally shot. The sound is good. The talent is doing the job cinematography is coming off well so you're you're using a no budget um feature film but you have a professional film that you could put up on streaming or anything and and it would and it would pass mustard and i think what i'm getting from you is like even if you don't have a budget still treat it like this is a professional project yes absolutely that's definitely it so like the amount of prep that goes into um, that went into Spa again. The amount of like, rehearsal, uh, just talking about costumes and props and um, logistics. But you know, even like say Proclaim, like we did loads of research on Proclaim on what they wore. So we went down to the detail of like even what you call these things. Um, you know those uh, suspenders. Well, yeah, the, the, for the guys. So we have those. Um, the, you know, the straps that they wear kind of that kind of attached yeah. there. Yeah, they, they they had two buttons, but the buttons would kind of fold inwards. They were actually buttons were on the inside. You often see these costumes where the buttons are on the outside, and that they didn't have them back then. Uh, oh wow, you got really fine things. details there. Yeah, yeah, but that costs nothing. As in, it only costs time, you know. Yeah. But if you're taking yourself seriously, and if you really want it to look good, then what? And and if you're if you're not making any money, no one's paying you. What you can do is in your own time. This is to do. This is the idea of commitment. That's why I'm saying commitment is so important. It is so important when you make that decision. You have to act totally professionally. If the, you know, even though it's a no budget, yeah, uh, affair. So put so, the, put the time uh, in. I like and that. Often costs nothing as well. People will rehearse with you because because you know them and you get to know them. You like them. You give them like you come over to your house, have some sandwiches and tea and stuff behind house. Where well, you get the rehearsal in. And um, that cost, that, I mean, that's brilliant. It's gold rehearsal. How much are you considering the lack of budget when it comes to actually writing the screenplay? Because to me, it sounds you know, like I you're fearless. <laughs> Such an no, I'm always <laughs> myself. To be honest with you. I just do it anyway. But uh, yeah, so what happened was, I suppose with uh, Proclaim, so I felt driven to do Proclaim because my granny... I uh, was uh, in Come On Them On, uh, which is Irish female freedom fighters. She okay. mentioned lots of history books and stuff. So um, I'm going right back. I'm related to Daniel O'Connell. He's, he's the big statue on O'Connell Street, you know, the great liberator and stuff. So so I, I really wanted to do something. I was coming back from London. And I was like, I have to be involved in this in this centenary. For heck's sake, come on. I have to do something. <laughs> and so yeah. this is what I did. So I researched Come On Them On, which is Irish female, female freedom fighters, first of all, but it was too epic. I thought I can't do that with no budget. So I stumbled upon the story of the Irish proclamation, which they printed in secret and there's 29 mistakes on it, which I didn't know about. There's an upside down E on it and everything. It's mad. It's a great story. So I thought, oh, I'll do this then and I'll just insert my granny into it. So I felt driven to do it because, because of that, kind of just uh, my, 
my relatives, my my family and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um. So, but then I was thinking about how, how can I do it? And um, I began just walking around Dublin going, if, if I can shoot this kind of, um, you know, with lots of depth of field, if I keep it moving to keep the kind of energy up so we feel kind of tense with people, but also yeah. it helps if we're close in on them not just kind of uh, story-wise because they're going to be tense and it's good to be, you know, in on the character, on their eyes and stuff when they're sweating for yeah. a tense story. But also it helps because we can cut all the traffic lights and all the modern stuff out, which is just Brilliant. behind the head. Yeah, you smart. Know? Um, so I was thinking about stuff. So I started looking and there's loads of lo- uh, old buildings. We had the James Joyce shop that we shot in uh, for the baby clothes shop, which was a an actual shop. That's where they... Kind of pretended to sell baby clothes stuff, and in the back they had the printers. You know. How about that? Yeah, so that that's all true. Like you know, that all yeah. happened. But I had to find a shop that would that looked right. And there was James Joyce shop. It's called Sweeney's Pharmacy. And I just went in there and I asked them, and they're like, "Yeah, <laughs> that's what we do there." <laughs> that's pretty I was awesome. Like, Are you sure? I was like, "Do you want any money?" And I was like, "I don't really have any money." They're like, "No, it's grand." And they're awesome. like, um, "Yeah, I only had booked half a day, and then I went up to your man." And so the thing is, they're very eccentric and they love Irish history because they love James Joyce. There'd be Ulysses in there all the time for all the tourists. But they get drunk. They give out the whiskey and stuff. And, you know. <laughs> but the, so, I, so I had half a day and I remember I went up and I was like, I'm, I kind of will need all of the day. And he went, oh, okay, sure, no worries. And he said, we'll go over to the pub. So they all came and all the American <laughs> tourists, the Japanese tourists, went with, you know, over to the pub. And they got absolutely hammered. That's hilarious. And so when I was finished, I was actually finished at 11 p.m. I went over to him and he was like, just, he was like, oh, it's grand. And he was totally blind drunk, like, you know, <laughs> he had a great time. <laughs> so I got really lucky, you know. And then uh, the GPO, like, I told you it was chance in my arm. I remember, like, an awful lot of it is chance in your arm, but you kind of, this is the whole thing about commitment. You still, you see, if, if you make the choice and you really are going to commit to it, you're going to kind of, I could have gotten myself into loads of trouble with the GPO. So we shot outside. So the GPO is this huge, like we still use it. It's our post office, our main post office. The post um, office, okay. Conference. Yeah, the general post office. and But it has bullet holes in it from 1916. So wow. You know, yeah, like it's uh, it's where they all, so basically, Fodger Pierce, he proclaimed the proclamation on the steps of the general post office in uh, O'Connell Street. So where I shot it is where he proclaimed it. Okay. And then after he proclaimed it, he went into the, into the post office with all of the Irish kind of rebels and they had a huge fight out there. Tons of people were killed and there's bullet holes everywhere still in the building and stuff, you know. So I didn't ask the post office, of course, because I knew that they'd say no. But I asked the uh, Gardaí, um, sorry, that's Irish for uh, please. Um, okay. So uh, they uh, they had a headquarters around the, the corner and uh, because it's to do with 1916 and because it's, so they'd be all quite patriotic. So they're like, ah, yeah, sure, go on. <laughs> I love it. I said I only have, I said I only have ten people and a tripod and a camera, and I thought I'd only have ten ten people, but I end up giving movieextras.ie um, a shout out, and I just sent them an email. And I said these, I said if you have any extras who want to come, I can't pay them, but I'll give them coffee and donuts and croissants and stuff. And I said here's photos of the costume I'd like them to kind of wear. If they have anything like that, I'd love to have them. And I had a few emails back and I, I would just click and paste the same thing to them all, kind of going, yeah, yeah, because they kind of, um, so Movie Exodus was their agent. So he'd get in touch with all of them and then they emailed me directly back. Right. I didn't think they'd turn up. 40 extras turned up in Oh, costumes. wow, that's great. In 40. costumes. In costumes. Wow. And then I also, I also didn't have like just tripod. I had a 14-foot crane with, with a <laughs> <laughs> oh did i forget to mention that <laughs> yes but then but then as well like i didn't have enough crew to look after our stuff and o'connell street can be quite run like you know it has loads of heroin addicts on it now having said that they are lovely they're really nice heroin addicts because they came along and they supported us they ended up wanting you know they're behind the camera asking me questions and stuff about about what was going on and they were really moved by uh, Michael, who was playing Claude Pierce, because he's brilliant at proclaiming, you know, uh, yeah. the Irish proclamation. So, um, but the Gardaí, we had two Gardaí there, and they ended up looking after our uh, extra equipment and our bags and our coats that we had to put behind the pillars. Yeah. I didn't have enough crew. 
And uh, we shot from 6 a.m. till 12 noon. And we got it in the bag. But it's, it, 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 it's as I say, it comes back to the main point of just commitment. You just, if, if you commit. Better to, I'd, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. That's it, exactly. <laughs> That's Werner Herzog, isn't it? I love him. That's hilarious. Yeah, he's great. I guess when it comes to writing the script, um, you're you're scouting locations and, and figuring out what you can shoot. All right, that's, that's yeah. really good to know. Um, I love the commitment angle. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It has to become a volition. It has to be, there is no other choice for failure. And I think you're right. I think some filmmakers some writers will uh commit to something but maybe they give themselves an out even though they don't realize it. it yeah yes so unconscious you see, very yeah i think you're right um yeah. the other thing i wanted to discuss with you um was i wanted to discuss with you teaching because you're a yes. teacher i'm i'm an instructor yes. and i think if you're able to teach something if you're able to to come at it from not even a mentorship perspective, but an emotional, I hate to say it, like experience of like, you've been there, you've been that nervous actor. I've been that insecure writer. Um, you can, you can connect with someone on, on a more raw emotional level. And I think it, it brings their game up it brings their it brings them courage and it brings them strength to the project i find it all helps everything kind of helps doesn't it but uh, i really enjoy teaching acting and sometimes it scares me how much i do enjoy it because i could kind of do it forever you just know? do it yeah um, yeah and i suppose yeah you, you almost have to teach from a place of love don't you to really kind of but you naturally do because you really see how how vulnerable a person is when they're trying to, especially with uh, acting, but I think it's with a, a, anything really um, that is creative, what actually what you're doing is you're kind of trying to heal through being uh, Wow, creative. that is that is so true. I've never really thought about that. Oh my gosh, Maureen, you're like 100% <laughs> right. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> I'm sorry to be No, you're right though, because you know everything that I do, I mean, this podcast, the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, is a podcast that I wish I had when I was first starting out. I mean, the book I write, I wrote was the book I wish I had when I first started. And it, and it is because you've been there, you've experienced that type of pain. And if you're a good person or a person of empathy, you don't want to see other people going through that. So you, yeah. you become a teacher, you become an instructor to try and help. And, and yeah, you're right. It, it, is a, it is a form of helping someone heal. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I, I think so. Anyway, you know, from my own experience, like I've found um, when people act, so the, the barriers that they come up against in, in acting um, are, are psychological barriers that have probably, you know, happened when they were kids, you know, these things that they, and so what you have to do is you gently lead them to those barriers and to keep kind of pressing on them. And they don't have to get it immediately or anything like that. They just have to come, you know, gently aware of it. So that eventually those barriers go down, they go down, and then they're more free as an actor to tap into emotion that they may not have been able to before that point. Um, so it's healing, essentially. So it's, it really that's is. Kind of what it is. It really uh, is. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, always, I've always heard it as character building, but I think, I think healing is... I think a far more accurate and, and truthful aspect of, of what we do with screenwriting. I, I have screenwriters come on and that I mentor and part of it is, is educating like, okay, this is the, this is the myth of screenwriting and here's the reality of screenwriting. But the other part of it is helping somebody find their voice as a writer to me means a lot because yeah. Um, you, you're, you've affected that person for the rest of their life. You know, a little piece of you will carry on with them and then they'll take what you've taught them and hopefully pass it on. Um, and so being able for me to help somebody find their voice is always, I get so much joy from it. Um, it's just, I still get letters today from writers that will send me like, you know, what you've done is you've helped me be able to, you know, write the screenplay and find my voice. And it feels, it just feels good. Of 
course it does. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of a two way thing, isn't it? It's uh, you're you're helping heal them, but in in that process, you kind of you know you are released too as well. Yeah, it's so crazy. It's, it's lovely. It's it's a really lovely occupation teaching. I think. Yeah, it's definitely symbiotic, and um, and I think the teachers that, that they can get overlooked, you know, like the people that taught us, I always try and, and pay respect to like my mentors and and uh, and make sure they get the credit credit due. But a lot of times, teachers, you know, the great teachers, they get looked over, but they don't need the credit because your success is the validation that they need. Yeah, exactly. So is there anything else going on, Maureen? Other than um, the fact that we went way deeper than I thought we would. Uh, yeah. I set up a film festival. Set oh, what is it called? Dublin uh, the Dublin International Comedy Film Festival. Oh, that's wonderful. First year then. Uh, yeah, it, uh, we did it on the December 3rd and 4th. Okay, very good. And uh, we actually had Bill Watterson's day made a maze. Yeah, yeah I, he was on the show. He's great. I He's love amazing. Dave. That 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 film is fantastic. Oh, uh, it's so brilliant, and it's so funny. Yeah, so it really he is. Was great. He did a Q and A and everything for us, and um, uh, we you know everyone just loved him. So like all the other kind of filmmakers, you know, whenever he kind of go on Twitter and say he loved someone's film, everyone would go crazy, and they're like, oh, we love him. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. there's an email me saying bill waters is you know like my film like, oh, he's awesome. girls i'm excited to see where you go with that feature um because i know you wrote in 2009 but my god is it is that did you ever hit something primal that really is timeless um wow. so i'm i'm really you know congratulations on landing the uh the funding in, uh through screen ireland because i mean that's every screenwriter's goal is to get paid to yeah. write and, I know, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So anybody listening in Ireland, Screen Ireland, I'm sure you're already aware of it, but that's a great way to uh to find funding. Um and for all of those um guerrilla filmmakers out there, commitment. That's Be it. committed to it like a marriage. And yeah. uh and and make it happen. Well, Maureen, it's been a real pleasure having you on and I wanted to say thank you. Oh no, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for it. It's absolutely lovely chat to you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share in your social media where you can tag us at The Successful Screenwriter.